Hello and welcome to another Beyond ATC video. Today I want to do something a little different. Normally we're flying the plane, we're talking about pricing and business and all that sort of thing, but let's do something a little bit different today. I want to do a deep dive into one of the problems that we've worked on uh, pretty much since the beginning of this software and just really show you what, go what goes into making this program, what really goes into our day-to-day -day thinking, uh, the thoughts that we have, the engineering that has to take place, the considerations we have to make when we're building a piece of software of this nature. Uh, we get people a lot of the time coming in the Discord being like, you know, why isn't this thing released yet? What, what's taken so long? How hard can it be? Well, I want to just take you through and give you a little demo. Um, this pro video will be probably pretty technical, a little mathy, uh, so if that's not your jam, feel free to skip on through. We'll get back to the flights soon enough, um, but for those that have kind of any interest on how the sausage is made, so to speak, I think this one might be of interest, so stick around. Okay, I'm going to take you through a single example of what we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Now remember, we're building an entire ATC program. That means that we have to load in your Simbri flight plan, we have to parse it for both the domains of FAA and ICAO, which each contain innumerable procedures and ways of handling things and dealing with things. Each one of those procedure types contains exceptions and they contain exceptions to the exceptions. If you have a specific type of SID, if you have an RNAV SID or you have a vector SID or you have a hybrid SID, those are all handled in different ways and those are all handled in different ways depending on if you're in FAA or ICAO land. So there is so much to do here and then not on top of that you know building back-end services servers all this stuff and i'm all i'm just saying all this just to illustrate what it is that we have to actually go and do every single day so for this example i'm going to take you through one single problem that we have to deal with never mind the thousands of others that we have to deal with i'm going to show you just one today so here we have you this is your airplane and this is you the pilot flying in the sky and here's us the atc the big eye in the sky that can see it all and our job is to get you to where you're going get you there safely and to follow procedure while we're doing it so most of the time you're just following your flight plan right you put your waypoints into the fmc the things happily flying along you're good to go but every now and again we get to a kind of a hole in that flight plan where we got to get you from one side of it to the other side of it and we got to get you there avoiding terrain we got to get you there following other traffic you know sequenced in and all that so that requires vectors and vectors are a tricky little subject because there's many ways that you can go about building these things. So I'm just going to give you a little example of how this would work in our program. Okay, so let's start off by building a little vector path. This path is totally arbitrary and it's just for the sake of illustration. None of this example would be used in real life or is real at all. But this path would represent where we want you to be, right? If your plane is following this path, you're in the correct spot. But of course, you don't have to be on that spot. If we tell you to go left, you can go right. So we need a way to compensate for errors, right? Let's say you're even following the path and wind blows you off the path. We have to be able to compensate for that. So according to Beyond ATC, the situation that's ideal is that your airplane is here and is following this path and goes along here and then follows that, okay? We're avoiding a mountain over here or something. So how do we do that? Well, it seems like it'd be pretty easy you just tell it to fly forward until we hit this spot. Then you just tell it to turn right. Then you tell it to turn left and turn left again. Problem solved, right? Well, unfortunately, it's not that easy. So let me show you why. First, we get your heading to go match that vector path. And then now let's say we want to send you right to here, right? Remember, there's a mountain here that we're trying to avoid or something like that. So we need to not have you overshoot that target. So now we need to tell you to turn right to go to this spot, okay? And let's just pretend for the sake of argument here that this vector on a heading outward from this is four, six, okay? So what we need to do, if we can tell you to turn to four, six, you would just follow this path perfectly and no problems. The problem comes in where we actually cannot give you a vector of four, six. We have to give you a vector divisible by 10. We can give you 020, 030, 040, but we cannot give you 046, which is what we need to get you to go here. So let's say now we round it up and we issue you the vector of 050, okay? So your plane is going along, we issue the, you the vector of 050, and now you turn to that. And notice there's a tiny error. You're not facing this spot perfectly. 
So as you fly along, it actually starts to go farther and farther away from that spot. There's error baked into that five zero. So, okay, you might be thinking, well, why don't you just get them to where they're far enough away and then turn them back in? But where do you do that? Do we turn you straight into here so that you have to turn hard left and then hard right? That doesn't make any sense. So why don't we just send you back to this vector position? But now remember, we can't give you five zero again. We have to give you four zero, okay? We can't give you four six. So we tell you to turn left and I think you're gonna to start to see where the problem is. Now you're going again in the wrong direction. So if we kind of look, plot what that would look like if we continue to give you the vectors like this, it's gonna to start to make this zigzag. And that's way more vectoring than we wanna do <laughs> just to get you to follow a straight line. That doesn't make any sense. So we need another solution. And that's where the next step comes in. So why don't we take a different approach to this? Let's just make it instead of having to send you to these specific zigzag patterns, let's just make it so that when you intersect this line, that's when we issue you a new vector path, okay? That should be a lot easier to work with. Okay, so let's try it again. You're going over to here. Now we turn your right. You have that little bit of error baked in here, but if now we intercept this spot, let's just draw a pretend line going out from here all the way down. Now, this is when we're gonna issue you, you the turn left and send you over to here, turn your left again, and send you over to here. Okay, that's all well and good, but how do you do that? Now we need an, what's essentially like an invisible line that extends outward into infinity from both these positions. And this is where it gets a little more complicated. So we need a way to figure out if let's say our invisible line extends from here into infinity in either direction, we need a way to then say, according to where you're at, I want to draw a line from here into this invisible boundary and get your distance from it, okay? So when the plane finally gets to that invisible boundary, we say, make a left turn and head to your new vector, which will then continue until you hit this invisible boundary right here. And then we want to turn you again. Well, that just became a lot more complicated. We can't just ask you where you are on an invisible line that extends for forever. We need a bunch of information to do that. So this is where it gets really interesting. So the first thing that we need to do is simply get an outgoing direction that goes. So let's just go ahead and mark these. And yes, this is gonna get mathy. So first we have our A and we have our B. So first that we need an outgoing vector from those two positions that gives us the directional vector from here to there. The next thing we need to do is get you to a new point. This is the vector AC, which now represents C minus A. So remember, this plane is C, okay? So we have A, B, C. So now we take that and we have to do even more math upon that. That's gonna give us a new value that's back from here. So we need the dot product of AC and DAB and we're gonna divide that by the dot product of DAB and DAB. Okay, now that is gonna give us a projection scalar, and that represents now a line that extends from here to that point. But unfortunately, that's not all, because the line is now just a line that goes off into infinity this way. We need to find out where that line intersects with this line 
so we can get a distance from it so we can check to see if you're close enough to this invisible line that we can now turn you left. So we need one more piece to this and that is going to be the new position and that is going to be A plus T times D A B. Now that is our final position, okay? So that gives us our position on this line right here that we can now say when your plane is going along here and it intersects with this line and is close enough within this radius, we're gonna issue you, you a new left turn and then follow that path all the way up till we hit this spot and issue you a new turn, okay? And once we plug that algorithm in, then we get something in 3D that looks like this. So remember, C is our airplane, A and B is the vector points that extends off into infinity. And then what we're trying to get is this position here, where C intersects the line that goes off into the distance from A and to B. So you see as we move it around, we find that intersection point. And likewise, if we go over here, it actually extends off well beyond both A and B, because remember, we're checking it into infinity. We don't actually have a start and end point of these positions. Now, likewise, we can take B and move the vector itself, and you see that C is correctly calculated against that point. And that works in all directions. So, of course, we're working in a 3D world where this needs to be calculated correctly since the airplane is in 3D space. But unfortunately now we have another problem. Okay, so let's say you're going along and the plane is moving along this route and we hit this spot and we detect that now we have to issue you a new vector. So we call you up and we say turn left to heading 010, right? Well, okay, now by the time the pilot actually hears all that information and inputs <laughs> all of it into their autopilot, they're now way over here, which is wrong. So if they turn to 010, you can see that now they're actually off course yet again. They're not going to the place that we need them to go, which is right here. So we have another problem in that the plane is not actually compensating for its speed. So now we need to take the speed of the airplane and project that speed into a point into the future where we're going to look into where the plane's going to be, not where the plane is. So that way, if just turn all this off and say this is the point in the future where we want to look at where the plane is. So now when the plane's going along, we want it to now hit it when it hits this spot. We now issue you the vector, you know, United 259 or turn left heading 010, and then they read it back. By the time all that took place, now they're actually where we want them to be. So we need to look ahead into the future and say, where are they going to be in X amount of time? And of course, the speed of the aircraft changes how much time into the future we need to be looking to, right? So now we need to go back and do even more math. Okay, so now we have our algorithm that's going to give us its position in the future. For that, we need the aircraft position, that's where it is right now. We need its speed in knots, that's what the sim is telling us. So if you're traveling at 240 knots, then we input 240 into this spot. Then we need to convert it to meters, and that's meters per second, because time is kind of baked into knots. It's a measurement of time and speed. So we take that and we say the speed in knots times this number, which converts it into meters, then we take the aircraft heading magnetic, which you know can be any value from the sim. Uh, in this case, we told you to turn to four zero, so you're headed probably to four zero. So we take the four zero and put it into the heading magnetic. And then what we, we need is the projection scalar, which gives us a line from here going off into space. That is going to give us the aircraft speed meters per second times the time in seconds that we want to look ahead. Then we're going to take all of this information and plug it into one final thing that takes the position that it's at right now and then adds a value that's offset by the projection scalar in the direction of aircraft direction and that gives us this spot so 
All of that is just now so we can look into the future and see where that X is going to be. And when that X hits that spot, we can now issue you an order to turn left. All of this, all of it, is just to be able to give you a single vector at a single point in time. The program is doing this and a billion other things at every single moment, and each one of them has equal complexity. So I really just wanted to show all this, just not to get all mathy and not to dive into all this stuff. I love this. I think it's really interesting. But, you know, th the point of this is just to show that every single problem we face is just as difficult as this. And everything that we do is subject to having to redo it, try new things, test it out. And of course, this might not be perfect either, right? There might be situations where if the vector line is a specific shape, this doesn't work out. But everything that we do, we push this forward a little bit more to try and get you something that is really, really solid and you know really feels like real life and is really giving you a good experience and not just sending you off into oblivion like I feel like a lot of programs do where they just you know send you off into outer space and <laughs> never call you back again. Not to say our program doesn't have problems, but you know, hopefully it will have some of these worked out. So I just wanted to give you a little uh, glimpse into a single problem that we have to solve in Beyond ATC and how we go about solving it. And I hope that you know gives you some context for why this thing takes so long to build, why it is that each thing that we do is really difficult and requires a lot of engineering and a lot of time and a lot of consideration to make sure that you're getting the best experience possible. So thanks so much for coming along this very, uh, <laughs> very technical deep dive into uh, some problems that we have in Beyond ATC and how we solve them. And I really appreciate it. So I hope you enjoyed it too. Have a good one.